Robert Guth is a uh, is one of the uh, Lindblad Expedition uh, photographers, and uh, this is a pretty amazing chunk of work you're going to get. Uh, and he's been working for National Geographic, and um, you guys prepare to be amazed. Eric, you ready to go? Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Warm up for Eric. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Yeah, as David said, my name is Eric Guth, and I stand before you today because, like many of the people you've heard, um, I have a relationship with the Arctic. And my relationship began as a photographer, as a naturalist working on Lindblad expedition ships. Um, but it took a turn that focused my relationship with the Arctic drastically in 2015 when I began to look at the Arctic through a different lens through a cultural lens. Um, that lens uh, with the Arctic, it, it got me thinking. So when you think of the Arctic, what do you think of? Throw out just one word, anybody. Ice, cold, barren, cold water, all those things, yes, exactly. This circle here represents the Arctic, everything within this circle. This is the geographic border of the Arctic. Did you know that four million people live within this circle? It's a number that I hadn't even realized when I first started going up there. Because when I first started to go to the Arctic, I was going there to photograph images of the things that you all said, images of ice and the wildlife and the incredibly stark beauty that comes in places like Svalbard and, of course, the charismatic megafauna. So all these images were things that I thought of of the Arctic and wanted to represent in my work beforehand, before I went up there. And it took a little while in my career to realize that I was missing something. I was missing a human element. And I had always kept humans out of my frame. They were kind of a nuisance that I wanted to crop out. But slowly I realized that they could be valuable. And if you see this iceberg here, there's a little Where's Waldo, those two little people right near the edge who take shots like this. I love glacier caving as well. So I started to realize the value of people, and slowly, cautiously, year by year, I inched closer, literally, to human subjects all over the world and became fascinated with what they had to say. And I got so close and I started to, to photograph more and more people, but I realized that I was still lacking a narrative for the people in my images. But that human inclusion in my work and the associated narrative of the people in my photos took a tremendous leap after reconnecting with this woman. This is writer and radio producer Jennifer Kingsley. She's from Canada. And she's the driving force behind a project that has been generously supported by Lindblad Expeditions called Meet the North. And I reconnect, reconnected with Jennifer, Jenny in, uh, in, on a National Geographic ship, the National Geographic Explorer, a, right before she was going to start this project. So she was just about to embark on her first week. And I asked her a little bit about what she was going to be doing. And she described her plan as to be a field correspondent, to go into remote areas to learn more about the cultures that are there. Because in the news, what are you hearing now about the Arctic? You're hearing about resource extraction, climate change, um, cultural issues. And you're never really hearing the stories from the people themselves. It's usually a writer or a journalist going up with a preconceived idea of what they want to share. So I was really taken by, by her idea. So Meet the North, in Jenny's words, is about telling different stories from the Arctic behind and beyond the headlines. It's about making a space for people to be seen and heard. And it's about building cultural understanding and celebrating that diversity. So this project also got me thinking of Humans of New York. Are you guys familiar with that Instagram feed? This is like Humans of New York for the Arctic, with the one difference being, and this was the brilliant part that really set the hook for me, is that every person we would meet, we would ask them for a recommendation. So our entire project was based on following the recommendations of the locals, letting the locals tell the story. So that's the concept, and it's simple. You meet one person, they introduce you to someone else, and then slowly and hopefully, you're sitting in the middle of a community and learning, learning about their stories from everybody. But this project really starts person to person. So how does my introduction to Jenny and my involvement in a well-funded project help you guys as photographers? 
Well, I hope to use my experience over the last three years as a template for how you might consider approaching a photographic project of your own. So we went to six Arctic nations, and so I'll kind of title each chapter with a, a certain theme that I think might help you in your work. But I'll start by just saying this. Just say yes to anything in the photographic realm. Um, if you have an opportunity, take it. And whether it's your vision or someone else's, it doesn't really matter. You just have to commit to an idea sometimes and get on with it. In my case, my offer to join Jenny for the first seven days of her project le led to these three years and six Arctic nations worth of coverage, just like that. And the concept wasn't mine, but it gave me the opportunity for structure and guidance in my work. And as a photographer, what I've realized is that most of the best photographers I've ever met are writers or historians or have a really good way with words. And as someone that's not like that, I decided I would pair myself with someone who was. And Jenny is the perfect person as a, as a correspondent for uh, the CBC in Canada and a published writer. So I thought it would be a great opportunity to learn how to tell stories and find stories. And uh, that's exactly what I did while also learning more about the Arctic. So let's go on a journey. And the first location we went to was Svalbard. And you've seen some images of this place already. And this chapter is all about testing the concept. So whatever it is you want to do photographically, sometimes you just need to dive in. And that's exactly what we did with this project. We didn't know how it was going to work in the end. Are people, is this idea crazy? Is it, is it going to lead to any interesting stories? Well, there's only one way to find out. So this is Longyearbyen. This is a town built on the back of the coal mining industry. And it's a place where nobody is born and where nobody dies. This is how it was described to us. Because it's so remote that everyone has to be flown back to the Norwegian mainland in order to get medical service if you're pregnant. Or if you're getting sick, they're going to fly you to the mainland. So the first person we met here, patient zero, if you will, is Helge Hovland. And this meeting was as uncalculated as it gets. This was the bus driver that Jenny had when she first uh, got in into Svalbard after working on the ship. So we spent some time with him. We went with him on the bus. He told us a little bit about his life and how he was interested in becoming a helicopter pilot. He told us a bit about how difficult it can be, be living in a small Arctic community like this. And after some time, we thanked him and asked if, uh, if he would have a recommendation. He recommended a friend who was a little bit busy, but he passed us on to this gentleman, priest Leif Magne Helgesen. This man was born in Madagascar to missionary parents, and he found his way doing the same thing, kind of doing missionary work, if you will. And he's now a Lutheran minister at a delegation in one of the churches in town. And after the service, we chatted with him. We asked him some questions about his life. And we asked him what he does when he's not leading a, a service. And we were lucky enough to find out that he's in a men's choir that is based on the back of the coal mining industry. And during our one week stay there, they were hosting their annual event where they were singing to a packed crowd in an old coal mining building. Dilapidated building, incredible acoustics. And these guys were singing songs, Norwegian folk songs, 15 tons, 15 tons, what do you get? You know. Um, and it was incredible. And despite how good it was, it wasn't until afterwards, in the bar, when we all got together to have a drink, that we realized that every political party in this town is represented in this choir. The Green Party, the pro-mining party, the Conservative Party, the Labor Party. And it turns out that through song and singing, they were able to put down their differences, even just for a little while, and sing it out. And that's what they did once a year in front of a packed crowd, and then every opportunity that they, they had otherwise. So. It might not be surprising when we ask them who we should talk to next, they recommended someone who's actually still working in the mine. And there's only a handful of people left, and this is an active mining town still. And this is Joachim, and he's one of only nine men working at one of these mines. And we asked him about his life there, and he said he appreciated the work, and he kept turning back to the history of mining in this area and how everyone still appreciates it in an interesting way. And though everyone, especially in a Norwegian country, knows that there's alternative energy options, they still kind of appreciate the fact that this one product, coal, is one of the only things that is not imported into their town. Because they're so far removed, everything else has to come in via vessel. 
So he shared with us why coal is still important in this very, very remote and cold part of the world. And that was Svalbard. Our next trip took us to Iceland, right on the edge of the Arctic Circle. And for us, the theme here was to pair the expected with the unexpected. I'm sure many people have heard of Iceland in the news a lot. I mean, tourism is huge in this country now. And our patient zero here was Goody. And she was a friend of, my, a friend of a friend of mine. And we had the chance of spending some time with her family. They're sheep farmers, and they're rounding up the sheep on their annual sheep rounding festival. And afterwards, she spoke to us in her backyard on her parents' property and told us a bit about the things that she likes about Iceland and what she um, associates with the, with the place. And of course, it was the things you might think about, the puffins, the rivers, the ice, and then, of course, the geology and the landscape. And these were things that she talked to us about. And every one of the destinations that we visited on her recommendations and others had people there. But most of them were tourists. And so we get all the pictures of, of Iceland and how they are of these pristine, beautiful landscapes. And what I started to realize is that every time I would turn around, there would be a scene like this. You'd take a picture in one direction, and it would be remarkable, and you turn around, and there's so many others there doing the same thing. And whether it be amphibious vehicles, selfie, 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 the sweet little couple with their little blue booties on at the geothermal springs, or just the sheer masses of people that you might not expect when you look at the brochures. And so we were actually curious if there's a part of Iceland that hasn't been touched by the, the tourist rush. And someone actually mentioned there is a place in the extreme northeast corner of Iceland on the Ring Road. There's a corner that hasn't been touched by tourism yet. And so we drove up there just trying to see what we could find. And it was a foggy night in one of the towns we pulled into. There was one light on, and it was a little hotel. And we walk inside, and we meet this gentleman, Erlinger Thordson. And th this couldn't have happened more perfectly. We never met this man before. He was not recommended to us whatsoever. But it turns out this man has been trying for years to bring tourism to this corner of Iceland, for years and years. And his plan in doing so is through this model, which he calls Arctic Henge part Stonehenge, part cosmic meaning place, where he hopes visitors can connect with their um, respective pillars, which are associated with your horoscope. He also was thinking about putting a telephone in there so you could reach out and call home like E.T. He had all these little plans. He was also um, uh, hoping that he could get some people in there and their ashes, Keith Richards' ashes in particular, um, if, if he were lucky enough to also draw in more tourists. So he's telling us about this huge plan. But what we really didn't know was that he had already set out and started it. This was already in the works. And he had built most of his Arctic Henge already. And so when I learned this, I went out the very next night and spent hours and hours and hours photographing this. And uh, it was an incredible scene. Unfortunately, Erlinger passed not long ago. Um, but what he left behind is a foundation for what he hopes would be an Iceland that draws people to every corner of this country. But it gave us an interesting take on how the tourist boom has impacted the psyche of this small Arctic town, whether you have tourism or whether you don't. Our next stop, Canada and Jenny's homeland. And this this part of the project was pretty tough in many ways, so respecting the process. From a photographic standpoint, it was really important going into a new place and a culture that I had never worked with before or met. And then Jenny, knowing that her country's history with um, residential schools and the, and the, the balance there, it was, it was kind of weighing on us when we went in, but we had an opportunity to fly across Baffin Island from Ottawa up to the northern end of this island and land at a place called Pond Inlet sits at the edge of the sea ice. And when we arrived, it was early spring. Temperatures were in the negative 20s. But still, this was springtime, and so the sun was starting to come out, and families were starting to appreciate uh, the return of that sun. A day after we arrived, there was a spring festival. 
And one of the great things about working with Jenny was that every once in a while when we were out working in the field, she would whisper a word to me or mention a photograph that she thought might be compelling. Again, her journalistic side coming out. And it helped me along the way to kind of pick out things. But in this case, being in a new place for the first time, in a culture that I wasn't familiar with, with the big lens, I was really intimidated. And I totally, I couldn't shoot. I had photographer's block. And what resulted photographically from that first counter out there was basically this. I wasn't able to get pictures. I felt I needed to take it more slowly and learn more about the people before I pulled out the big lens and started shooting. So it was a really frustrating time and Jenny and I went back and forth and she felt she needed images and I knew I needed images and so luckily enough, a couple weeks later, hunters returned and they had a festival for the meat that they were able to bring back. And so everyone got together in the community hall and so slowly and cautiously I started taking pictures just of people's feet, just of details. I was literally a fly on the wall kind of standing back and just trying to get the scene from afar. Or sometimes coming in close and just getting shots of hands. And no adult space was I willing to, to photograph. For some reason, I still had this block. Um, but children, I started to turn the lens to. But I wanted to make a concerted effort just to take this slowly and not overwhelm anyone with our presence. And feeling still internally overwhelmed, um, Jenny and I set off and, and kind of took a couple days to reevaluate. And while we were out on the sea ice, kind of thinking of ways to approach our project and, and get into people's hearts, she came up with the idea of going to the local bake sale, which they have once a week, and selling our concept to the people there. So other people were selling pizza and ice cream, and we, just, we sold the idea of Meet the North, and we showed images and publications that we had um, done in the past, and it kind of gave the locals the idea of what we were up to. And it helped tremendously, and it did open doors for us. We ended up meeting people like this, Shelley and Carrie Elverum. These are our patient zeros for this part of the world. These two moved up to Pond Inland to work, and they never left. And they raised a family. And they started to share with us the, the dynamics of their family. And Naya, the little girl in the pink on the upper right, and Judy, her mom, and how Naya was adopted by uh, Shelley and Carrie because Judy was a young mother and needed help, and how everyone got interwoven. And I learned more about Zoe Elverum, their daughter, who, is a, who, as you can see, has dwarfism, but also has a love for Star Wars and Taylor Swift. And, uh, and her strength, because in Inuit culture, it turns out to have dwarfism means that all the power and strength and knowledge that you have in a full-size body is compressed into a smaller body. And it's, it's seen as a good thing to have dwarfism. And the nickname for Zoe was Zoe Yupik Elverum. And Yupik means snowy owl. Because when she was born, she was small, white, and she had to be flown to the hospital in the south so that they could help her due to her, her dwarfism when she was born. And we met more families, and, and things felt better at this point. And so as we were about to leave this place, which we go to on our Limblad trips, just not this time of year when there's this much sea ice, Jen and I looked at each other and we were wondering, do you think we made an impact? Do you think they respect and appreciated what we did here? And just a couple days later, moments before we left, I was out taking pictures of some of the local kids playing hockey, and we got our answer. Because the, the mayor of the town approached us one day, just days before we were going to leave, and asked if we could stay a little bit longer. And if we could stick around to photograph and document a very special guest, a very special visitor who was coming up to their town for the first time ever. And we were humbled. And we changed our flights, and we stuck around. So the day arrives, and everyone gathers, and everyone's looking through the fence to, to welcome this, this big visitor. And the plane lands, and out comes this box. And I'm not quite sure what's going on. And from inside the box comes nothing other than the Stanley Cup. <laughs> this hockey nation of Canada, the NHL, had granted the distribution of the Stanley Cup to four tiny Arctic communities. And this was the first time Palm Inlet had a chance of receiving it. And everyone was elated. And so what ensued was them placing the cup on the local fire truck, driving it down to the edge of the sea ice where they had plowed a strip through the snow across the sea ice to an iceberg. All the kids in town wearing their hockey um, paraphernalia lined the strip. They put it onto the back of a sled dog, and they sledded it to that iceberg. 
and then none other than Lanny McDonald, who was a Calgary Flame who had won the Stanley Cup in the past, helped them to carry the Stanley Cup up to the top of that iceberg and place it in front of the town, and then give a chance for all the kids and even a local Mountie to gather and take pictures with the Stanley Cup on an iceberg in Pond Inlet. And they gave us the opportunity to stick around and photograph just that. And uh, I think that was our answer, which meant that we had done our job there. And that was wonderful. The next stop, Greenland. And the west coast of Greenland is remarkable. We go there on our trips as well. And I've spent a lot of time there personally, um, doing personal photographic projects. And this was a chance to find a theme. And this was something that Jenny was really good with as well. She would kind of come up with a thought or an idea um, if I hadn't come up with something already and tell me to work on it. And she also gave me the freedom just to shoot whatever I wanted, the most beautiful things I could find. She said, just go out and take pretty pictures. I'm like, yes, awesome. And so I did. And so usually what I'll come back with are pretty pictures, and, but not as much to tell the story of the culture sometimes because I get locked in the, the landscape photographer zone. So testing... Uh, so this approach was about finding a theme which was contrasting portraits. So what I wanted to do was contrast the landscape that you might think of with what life looks like here. And there's a Danish influence in Greenland, and so uh, this is what some of the towns look like. This is Sisimu on the west coast. And then we started to meet more people when we were there. And this is Serena Peterson, and what she does for work is rescues these sled dogs. These are sled dogs that have been abandoned and are running around the, her town in Asiat in West Greenland, and they will be euthanized unless, they're, unless something is done. And so what she has done is she has purchased this little island, and she takes these sled dogs to this island, and she comes out a couple times a week to feed them, and she's doing whatever she can to, to rescue these, these dogs who don't have as much work to do now that there is less ice in some of these communities. When she's not doing this, she keeps practicing her traditional drum dance, which keeps up with her traditions of her ancestors and also allows her to express herself. So those are her two worlds. Then we met Fleming Bisgard, who does one of the most dangerous jobs on the planet. He's a helicopter pilot up in the Arctic, and he hauls heavy equipment all over the place with these helicopters. He was a man's man. He, just, he had so many stories, and uh, despite all that, it also turns out Behind the scenes, he also has an eBay habit. <laughs> he loves eBay, and he has, massive, he has huge storage containers of all sorts of stuff. And this is one of the things that he loves. On the day that we arrived, he had just gotten Mrs. M&M in a big crate. This is Mr. M&M, and he was telling us, telling us about the time and the moment where he was going to unite the two for the very first time out on the sea ice at the edge of the west coast of Greenland. So this is what Fleming, a helicopter pilot in Greenland, and someone that used to work for the military does in his free time. From here, let's go to our country and go up to western Alaska. This was about finding the story within the story. Because when we went up here, it was that time of year what, what a lot of people head up for, which is the Iditarod. And we thought it would be a good time to meet people because there would be a lot of people in town, a lot of locals, there would be a lot going on, and we could gather some stories. And so we saw people coming across the finish line during the daytime. Some of the mushers finished at night, and still there were people there to greet them. We met Jason Mackey, who is one of the, the Mackey brothers, and who's, whose father had won the Iditarod, and, his, and um, his older brother Lance Mackey has won it four times. Here he is standing under the burled arch. This is the finish line. He even has a tattoo on his arm of it. But as we were photographing everybody, I noticed a conspicuous lack of Alaska natives there. Hardly any Alaska natives were at or in the Iditarod. And I was really confused why. And so I started to ask why that was and where everybody was. And someone ushered us down the road to the local basketball tournament. You'll appreciate this, Ralph. And, uh, and this is where most of the Alaskan Eskimo, which is the, the local group in the Yupik, spend their time. They love basketball up here. And this was one of the biggest basketball tournaments of the year. And so everyone arrived. There were many divisions, many brackets, kids of all ages. And when you looked into the crowd, it was just the faces of people you might expect to see in Western Alaska. 
And it was just a really interesting juxtaposition of what I would have expected to have seen at the Iditarod versus where those people actually were and how they kind of flip-flopped um, cultural interests in a way. So this is where I'd expected everybody, but um, when we were there, one of the small islands from the central part of the Bering Sea had made it to the state championship for Alaska. So we all went, all went out to the bar after the tournament and we watched them and their team playing on the big screen because a lot of them had come from that town. And it was a wonderful way of bringing our experience up in Alaska full circle. Our final stop, and probably most ambitious, was our 2017 trip to Russia, to Russia's Far East. And this was part of a 50-day National Geographic grant. Jenny became a National Geographic explorer through this, and as I've done every other trip, I tagged along. This story was all about peeling back the layers. This entire journey was about that. It was about peeling back the layers of Russian history and um, everything that we had learned previously on this trip. And we had picked up a lot of stuff. And so I want to use this last location as a way to explain the dynamics between Jenny and I and how I, as the photographer, with her help, pooled all the lessons we learned on previous trips into a vision for nearly every shot in this series. Except for this one, of course. This was the pilot taking a photo of us in our chartered plane, the only way we were, we were gonna easily get from Alaska to Russia. So we flew from Nome, it was 50 minutes, and we went ahead 22 hours in time zones because <laughs> we jumped right over the, the date line there. Flying over the Bering Sea and landing in Chukotka where Limblad is going soon. And part of our time spent up here, Jenny and mine, was to do a little bit of scouting for the Limblad trips that are beginning there uh, later this summer. And so it was, it's a way for us to build cultural appreciation in the places we go. And then when Jenny and I go back to Russia, we'll be able to say hello to the friends that we met along the way with our Limblad guests as well, which we have found to be a really nice partnership. But we started in Providenia. This is a community built on the backs of Soviet presence. And looking around this town, I personally was taken initially not by the crumbling facades, but by the beauty. I thought it was absolutely beautiful, the way everything was peeling back and kind of crumbling back into the earth. And I spent a lot of time walking around in the evenings, just kind of taking shots to set the mood of the place because, yeah, there was a diaspora. I mean, a lot of people left Perestroika, and it was a pretty heavy time. But uh, I would just take still lifes and scenes, just trying to show aspects and details of everything going on and what's left behind. And I'd come back to Jenny in the evenings and I'd show her my work and she would look through stuff and initially she said, there's not enough people in there, there's not enough life. Um, this is what we're here for, this is a cultural project. Until I showed her this shot, and this is one that I wouldn't have really picked. I mean, it didn't do it for me, but what she liked is that it pointed to the light. Where these lights are emerging are where the people who remain here still live. It's where the strength of the community has been concentrated after everyone has left. And that made sense to me. And so that led us into the heart of the town where we met our patient zero for Russia, Vladimir Bichkov. He's the director of Beringia National Park, which is the youngest national park in Russia. And he introduced us to the people that work on his staff, and they were nothing but smiles. Some of the most lovely, warm people, so happy to see us. They don't get much tourism in this area. And, uh, and so it was a very warm welcome. Showed us into their office. And these are all the maps about, uh, that kind of speak to all the different regions that they're managing now. And they had all these banners and streamers all throughout the year. It was, it was just really warm and inviting. So despite the exterior looking like this, every time we stepped inside anyone's home, it looked like this. Almost every house had huge plants and a warm glow. And uh, it reminded us that layers are a big part of this place. The facade is one layer, and then you peel back that initial layer, and you find something else. And especially in Russia, with all the preconceived ideas I had about Russia going into it. And so that was the assignment. We started thinking about that, and layers was my new theme for Russia. And Jenny gave me carte blanche to go out and take any shots I could think of that associated with that concept. 
So sometimes it was just very literal stuff. Layers of paint peeling off this old Soviet outpost at the edge of the Bering Sea because they wanted an outpost there in case US forces came over. Layers of the local past, the Siberian Yupik who lived here. And here you can see some whale rib bones um, kind of eroding out of the landscape right at the edge of the Bering Sea. The way the landscape is kind of turning back into, or the buildings are turning back into the landscape. So these were metaphorical layers for Russia's Soviet past. But then there was an interesting overlapping layer, Russia's Soviet past and its indigenous past. So Jenny pointed this out to me, these two reindeer in this old building. It was an old um, gymnasium in the town. And to me, this captured the perfect image to transition us to the next part of our project in Russia, which was to hang out with a group of Chukchi reindeer herders. This was the only prearranged visit we scheduled during the entirety of our project. Um, but we wanted to do so because we wanted to learn more about modern Russian life from a group of people most people probably don't associate as being modern. Reindeer herders, reindeer husbandry, is, that's not modern. But what is life like for a reindeer herder now? And speak about layers. This is the 12th Brigade. 12th Brigade is a group of reindeer herders. There's only about 15 of them. And they're continuing the traditional legacy of being nomadic reindeer herders. And in the old days, they used to um, lash up the reindeer and break down their tents and pull their living quarters on the back of a sled. And they go from place to place to place. Nowadays, post-Soviet Union, there was all the this, this surplus of tanks. They are now subsidized by the, by the government to continue reindeer herding. And they've been issued these Soviet era tanks, which they call ATVs. It's like Mad Max meets reindeer husbandry. It was like, it couldn't have been better. It was like, this is incredible. So we spent a week with these guys out in the field and cruise around in these ATVs. These are their Yurangas. And, uh, and then this shot I took because it showed where this product is going, where, these reindeer, where this reindeer meat is going on this little tin here. It's kind of like a tuna can. And they use that to send a stronger signal. They tie this can onto the string to send a stronger signal so that they can update the, the people that are managing the herd from afar as to what the progress of the, of the herd is and where they are. So that's their link to the outside world, is this can attached to a, to a string. And so to get back to the layers concept, Jenny wanted more layers. And here are three generations of herders all standing together, packing together the herd. So this is the image that I came up with as my best attempt at that. And then we met Nikita. He's the, the brigade leader. He's a really calm, cool character. And and he told us a lot about life here and took us out into the field. And unexpectedly, you might not have expected us to ask for a recommendation when we were in a place where there was only 15 people. But we did, just like we've done in other places. We asked Nikita, who should we talk to to learn more about this place? You've shared this with us. And he said, you should talk to any of the women in the brigade. They'll give you a good perspective on what life is like out here. And so we did. And this is Valentina. We went out with her for one of the days and uh, while she was out herding. And she was pretty soft-spoken and didn't give us too many details on life. But she did recommend that we speak to someone else. And this is Maya, one of the only other women in the group. And she had her childhood split between town, small little towns nearby, and the tundra. She studied cooking. She had a daughter. She got married. And then she came back to the tundra. So out here, she's officially listed as the veterinarian for this group. And that's a lot of what they do, is they take care of some of the animals um, when they're not sending them to market. Um, so, and then she keeps up the Yurangas as well. And so here she is. She's preparing some of the meat, which is then going to be sent elsewhere. And so this was my final shot that, to me, represented layers from this trip. And it reminded me of Moscow and the other side of Russia, and the things that, uh, that some of you might associate with it as well. And so them transporting this meat in this bag, this meat was now going to another community nearby, a community that had a lot of connections with the reindeer herders for years and years and years. And it was on the coast. And this is the town of Lorna. We also tried to get many shots that just showed the tiny, tiny towns in these really vast landscapes. Lorna is a coastal marine mammal hunting community. They hunt marine mammals from seals to whales. 
And this is the group. These are some of the men that go out there. And just like the reindeer herders, the government is, is paying them to do this. And we just happened to arrive the day that they had pulled up two gray whales. Two of the, 60, uh, two of the 46 that they're permitted to take every year as part of their traditional harvest. Um, traditional harvest that then goes to the rest of the community. And so while it was gruesome, it was a, it was a really good chance to look at the community, the community all coming out, and to think more about layers as well. Layers of the indigenous community, layers of literal layers of the meat here. And even in the left there, you can see a guy on the far left wearing a, a GoPro on his head. And that's a scientist that's actually coming out from the west of Russia to kind of monitor and make sure that they're doing this properly and taking skin samples and blubber samples of the whales and making sure this, this is a sustainable resource. There were layers of the guys just kind of sitting quietly on their phones with meat piled up behind them. And then we followed the meat. It was a strange concept to me, but Jenny said, let's follow this meat. Where is it going? What are they doing with it? Some of it goes to the, to the dogs, the sled dogs, and they would lash themselves up like they were pulling sleds and pull this meat along. Some of the meat was for the dogs. Some of the meat was for themselves. And the meat that was for themselves went into these lockers. This is what we called the meat hole. And this was built, this was a tunnel built into the side of a permafrost hill. And this is where they store everything. So this is their equivalent of going into the supermarket, into the freezer. And you open these two big wooden doors and you walk down this long corridor. And as a Glacier Cave photographer, I was in heaven photographing this. And, but it just showed a slice. And then I looked up at the ceiling and talk about layers. These were layers of ice crystals that had formed from the moisture from these carcasses as they were put in there. And it reminded me of all the years that they had been doing this and how traditional it had become. And then we went back out on the beach and we returned to this scene. And to me, it was a telling reminder that our roots develop at a young age and are not easily severed. So peeling back the layers in the end reasserted the goal of our project. And Meet the North began as our attempt to, attempt to challenge cultural assumptions about life in the Arctic to peel back the layers of misunderstanding that come with geographic and cultural divides. And we did so by embedding ourselves in people's lives, their landscapes and communities, and letting them guide us and their story along the way. So through all that and our work and our methodology, it did lead to some online publications in National Geographic and a number of other things that we were working on. But it was having Jenny as an in-the-field editor for me that was really beneficial and priceless. Because she made me think about how to approach the subject matter from a more expansive perspective. And our skill sets matched each other really well. And often she would look at my images, images that I just passed over and would have trashed had it not been for her like this one, and she told me in the end that this image, more than any other, summarizes the whole project in her opinion. Because what it was about to her and to us in the end was looking over someone's shoulder and seeing the world from their perspective. And unknowingly, I had done that by taking this shot. And Jenny said a really special thing. And she said, stories are nothing without people to hear them. And that's what we were doing on our trip, was trying to bring back stories from very remote corners of the planet. And uh, I thank you for listening to our story. Thank you. So in your landscape photo with the aurora borealis, um, so how is it that the sun is still up, but it's so dark? Yeah, so the question, yeah, you heard the question. Um, that was the moon rising, believe it or not. So the moon had just come up, and there was enough light. My ISO was probably. 2,000 or so to bring up as much ambient light as I possibly could. Yeah. Anything else? Any other yeah. questions? Over there? <laughs> What's the next step, says my boss. Um, next step, so we have continued this project into warmer places, <laughs> graciously. Um, so we are now doing a project we call Pacific Stories, and we've been going to French Polynesia doing the same type of thing, trying to gather stories from other parts of the world where you might have preconceived ideas of what life might be like there. Uh, so we've done that, and we're constantly pitching story ideas wherever we can. And I'm going to continue to be a landscape photographer and continue working with you as well, Ralph. 
Um, but yeah, that's, that's um, where we're at with this next, and we'll see where it develops and where it takes us. Phenomenal photographs, and um, I appreciate how you, you've got the context, which is so priceless, and it's very hard to get that right. For instance, in this photograph, right? You, yeah. It really says a lot. Um, but So the fourth wall goes away, and you actually feel like you're in there, but you go into a place like this, and you've got a camera, and you're, you feel sort of invasive. Or I would feel, you know, so I, I feel really invasive. So how did you manage that? You, you mentioned that you took some time, pull back, and try to get more relate relate more to the environment but how did you yeah. how did you do that yeah uh, i think it's a subtle thing for sure uh, establishing relationships and i think that's one of the reasons why jenny was interested in having me come along as a photographer i've always been really sensitive to cultural interactions and interpersonal interactions and i i don't like discomfort in a relationship and so i'm very cautious on how i approach my relations with anybody and so Having that as a background and as a precedent, I think it was a good starting point, and Jenny's the exact same way. And, um, and having the time to be patient, now, you don't always have the time. Sometimes a, a shot is there, and some people are willing just to take it and not ask permission and all those things. For the long game, the way we did it worked out really well. Sometimes you might have to hit it sooner, and if we had less time, I may have had to go into that, that spring festival, guns blazing. and. It's not really the way I do it. And I've lost many, many photographs um, by just being a little bit too, too cautious about that. But in the end, I, I feel it works out. You say that, you know, in the cycle, they got, you know, uh, four million people who live right there, right? Yep. And how many countries you got right there? So there are nine Arctic nations um, in, in the Arctic Circle, yeah. So there's four million people living in nine Arctic nations north of the circle. Hi, um, what advice do you have to photographers and reporters, um, for a photographer looking to work with a reporter and vice versa, and just kind of forming that team, that relationship? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's doing what you're doing now, being here, being at conferences like this, I think networking and meeting people as you, as you go along, contacting writing reporters or journalists whose work you appreciate and telling them who you are and what you're doing. Um, tagging along on assignments. I mean, it's just building those relationships and meeting people that are doing things you want to be a part of. There's no other secret beyond that. It's, it's beating the street and, and going out. And if you don't meet them through a scenario like this, reaching out to, the, to them personally. And, uh, and I was lucky because I had known Jenny and I met her at the right time. But uh, yeah, you sometimes need to, to pound the feet. And there was a National Geographic writer who I wanted to do a story that I'm working on in Mount St. Helens. And I just blindly emailed him and said, I would love for you to write this story that I've been photographing. And he was totally game. He liked the work. He liked the project. And, uh, and we've been talking about it ever since. So reach out. That's all I can say. As a photographer, you have to be personable to the people you try to connect with. Since you jump through these different Arctic cultures, how do you handle the difference of the cuisine dealing with the people that you have to sort of be nice to? Oh, how'd, I, how'd we respectfully decline food that we didn't want to eat? Is that what you're asking? <laughs> well, I did a much better job with that than Jenny did. She was struggling many times, and there was a couple moments where I had to pull the big spoon and, uh, and finish her plate for her. Um, and yeah, that's part of it. Trying everything at least once is a big part of it, and there's a lot of cultural differences food-wise, especially up there. And um, yeah, I was, I was surprised by a few meals, but yeah, I think it's really important to at least try something. And we choked down a lot of stuff that we didn't want to continue eating, but that's part of the deal. And uh, yeah, you, you go with it. We knew what we were getting into. We knew that th those moments would arise, and uh, yeah, you roll with it. What's your preferred lens to use during your uh you know, during your projects? Like. Yeah. I would say on this project, I used my 24 to 70 Nikon more than anything. Um, it's a great portrait lens. You can also get wide enough. I like, like Franz Anting, he kind of does that environmental portrait of wildlife, and I like that feel as well with people. That's the workhorse for me. It's probably my favorite lens. Um, but I carried a 17 to 35 and an 80 to 400. Those were the, the three lenses I had with me everywhere I went. 
Yeah, I've been, I've been up in the Arctic, but the question I have for you is, um, I mean, traveling in the Arctic is really expensive mm -hmm. and difficult to get there. So all your, your funding for this all comes from? Uh, funding all comes from Limblad Expeditions, yeah. Um, and Sven Limblad, the owner of the company, basically Jenny helped Sven out um, during one of our trips, and Sven, in gratitude, asked her, if you had a magic wand and could do anything for two years and that I could help fund, what would it be? And she said, I'd love to be a field correspondent in my Arctic country, in the Arctic portion of my country up in Canada. And, uh, and he said, that's a good idea. And so he said, with the stipulation, I'll fund that if you go to the places that Limblad travels as well, so you can kind of be ambassadors for our company. And so almost every location that I showed you images of today are places that Limblad goes to in some capacity. And some of the connections we've made when we go back and we have a chance to introduce our guests to the people that we spent five weeks with in some cases, it really brings it all together. So in the end, I think Limblad made a pretty good investment. And they've continued to fund us um, into the foreseeable future. Thanks, Thank everybody. You so much.